work to create a world that's free of infectious diseases. We work to make sure that no infectious disease is left unchallenged. We discover, develop, implement and evaluate health solutions. Working alongside the most at-risk communities. Doing so ultimately builds a healthier, safer world for everyone. We are the Kirby Institute. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2023 David Cooper Lecture entitled Michael Kirby, Health and Human Rights. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Benjigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and I extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make an admission to you as I start this evening on behalf of the university. Firstly, as you get older, there are many, many fewer people that you truly respect. And so I came to, to tonight with an enormous agility and absolute excitement because there are two people that are referred to tonight that I immensely respect. First, the David Cooper, after whom this lecture is named, and I'll say a few things in a minute about David. And secondly, the speaker, Michael Kirby. I've respected him since I was a student, and although I look old, that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the David Cooper Lecture honours the legacy of the Kirby Institute's founding director, Professor David Cooper, who passed away in 2018. I'd like to warmly welcome David's family, Dori, Beck and Ilana. It is absolutely marvelous to have you here with us and to celebrate David's legacy, which I assure you is alive and living at this university and of course because of what he did throughout the world. David was an international renowned scientist and HIV clinician. He laid the foundations for Australia's ongoing global leadership in the fight against the HIV epidemic. David led the centre, which today we call the Kirby Institute. By the way, there is no prize for guessing who Kirby is in the Kirby Institute. With intellectual rigour, drive and determination, and indeed enormous insight, he led it for 32 years. He was involved in the development of every HIV drug approved in Australia, making important discoveries and providing the evidence base that informed and drove not only the Australian response, but the international response to HIV too. Tonight, we're going to hear from Michael Kirby, who is the patron of the Kirby Institute and who very graciously, some years ago, agreed for his name to be placed in the Institute's name. Michael and David were dear friends. They worked together during the darkest days of the HIV epidemic, uncovering health solutions to improve the lives of the communities impacted by HIV. Michael Kirby is someone who doesn't need introduction, but let me just mention, he is a highly distinguished jurist and legal scholar, and he is still our longest serving justice of the High Court of Australia, and that just demonstrates how young he was when he took the position. I was given a long list of the things that Michael has done. 
He's tirelessly advocated for equal access to health care. He was a pioneer as an AIDS activist, and he was a member of the World Health Organization's Global Commission on AIDS. We're extremely lucky to have him here tonight, but I actually took umbrage. I know he has 109, if not more, honorary doctorates, but no one mentioned he has one from this university, and I'm very proud that we did that. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Michael will be in conversation with Geraldine Doog. Geraldine is a renowned journalist and broadcaster. She's won two Penguin Awards for Excellence in Broadcasting from the Television Society of Australia, and she's also won a United Nations Media Peace Prize. In 2000, she was awarded a Churchill Fellowship for Social and Cultural Reporting. Let me not hog the stage. You've come to see two um, great people talk to us, so please, may I welcome Geraldine and Michael to the stage. Well, thank you very much. I often say when you, you know, have introductions um, that I quote Nicholas Tomlin, who was one of the better known members of my profession, the only qualities necessary for real success in journalism, a rat-like cunning, a plausible manner, and a little literary ability. <laughs> so I bring that tonight <laughs> to, uh, and, and let's see what you, what you judge about that particular suite of skills. Uh, look, it's just fabulous to be here, really wonderful, uh, on this special occasion uh, to be uh, uh, in conversation with Michael. There is rather a lot to discuss, I must say, and I know that Michael will want to have his say. He's known to have his say. So what we will try to do um, is record about 35 minutes of our chat, and then you can join in with your questions. Um, because we, we do have a lot to cover, health, the law, friendship, change, justice, uh, issues that have very much uh, been maintained over a lifetime. We will discover, strangely enough, even though he's known as Justice Michael Kirby, that a lot of his good work has occurred outside courtrooms, and it's that very interesting overlap, as I think he has seen it, between the law and the culture and the community that I must say, as I read about him, I have found most fascinating. Uh, change the law and you gradually shift the emotions of the community. I mean, that's very much a truism of sociology and it's known to be that way. Um, and certainly when the possibility arose, as you'll hear, for him to use the law to wind back some egregious discrimination, he grabbed it fast, uh, and he grabbed the opportunity. He seized the day, if ever anybody did. So we will be looking at um, whether we have a right to still keep dreaming about more egalitarian health solutions globally, which I know still preoccupy him, at the relationship between health and stigma and discrimination and equity, very much issues thrown up during, uh, during the AIDS epidemic. Now, Michael, I want to start with your character, if I may, please. I want to start personally, because several people have indicated to me, and you have yourself in some interviews, that you never took on that propaganda that people uh, of same-sex attraction had to be worried about themselves, that they were essentially uh, for, you know, flawed human beings, that the image was terrible, loads of guilt. You never took that on, which you think very much helped you in your, in your life of, of action. And I was going to quote that lovely line of Eleanor Roosevelt's, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. <laughs> and I wonder if you do reflect on that, uh, that you were able to transcend all of that awful stuff? Well, um, it, it all came about in about 1948, uh, when I was eight or so, and uh, it came about because of the work of Alfred Kinsey. 
Uh, now, uh, in Australia in that time, we never talked about sex, never, never, never. And Alfred Kinsey, who had started out as an expert in bees, he got bored with bees and he turned from bees to human beings and to their sexual uh, lives and the variations and, and so on. And uh, it was a sensation at the time. And it came to my notice as a young boy, and uh, it stayed with me, and the press was full of it, and uh, I learned about it, and I thought, when I discovered my sexual orientation, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, Dr. Kinsey says that it's not all that rare, and it exists in all societies, and it's just part of the reality, so get over it and uh, get on with other things. And basically, that's what I did. And when people, including church people, went on about the abomination and so on, I just used to look puzzled and think, well, you're just wrong. So I never had a sort of a feeling in my, that I had to be terribly anxious and worried. I wasn't very open uh, in the sense of confronting others with it, but in my own inner being, mm. I didn't feel guilty and I didn't feel an abomination. I felt that actually I was rather an attractive person <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, therefore okay. people had to get, get used to it. And that's, that's, I think that rescued me. So it goes to show the role media plays yes. and it goes to show the role science plays and it goes to show the importance of education and getting the message over to uh, young people uh, who have been discriminated against that it's just wrong and don't let it worry you too much, just get on with life and confront it and do what you can to change it. And that basically is what I've been doing. Yes. It is what you've been doing. Well, in fact, you were quite confident of yourself, and I, I, I have to ask you to talk about some of your seduction lines, which were uh, quite unique. Could you tell us, no, that if you wait till you hear it, tell us the story, please, of your opening gambit with your longtime partner, Johan, who's uh, sitting here tonight, listening, back in 1969. Oh, it's so embarrassing, but I won't let that get in my way. Johan is here, and uh, he has been with me for 55 years, and... Uh, uh, and uh, we, we actually went to what was then one of the few uh, gay venues in Sydney, at least few that we knew of and I knew of, and uh, he had only been there once before, I think I'd been there twice, to the Rex Hotel. Uh, people ask me, you know, is he a professor? And, is, and I say, no. Uh, where did you meet? Uh, did you meet in a university or something like that? And I said, no, we met in a pub. And we met in, a, a, in the bottoms up bar at the <laughs> Rex Hotel. Uh, it's now, and I'm going to give a free plug here, the uh, Cafe Rex in King's Cross. They pulled down the old building. And um, so we went there and I said, uh, I saw this handsome looking man and I thought he looked German. And he started to speak. And I studied German at school and I had a really good German accent. <laughs> And I, I started to speak to him, uh, and I said, uh, what did you think of von Ribbentrop? Uh, and <laughs> your opening von line. Ribbentrop. And uh, he looked at me uh, with a puzzle in his eyes, because he wasn't German, he was Dutch. And that, that is not a good uh, thing to mistake. And so um, uh, he said something like, um, well, I think he's a... He was a better um, uh, champagne salesman than he was a foreign minister. And that really surprised me, that he knew something about von Ribbentrop and he passed the first test. <laughs> it's like Turin Dot, you've got three tests and you've got to pass them. And so um, I've, I met this uh, very good looking, I still think he's good looking after all these years. He is. And he said, well, I, I, uh, he ultimately thought, 
who is this rat bag? Why do I always seem to meet ra rather strange <laughs> people? But it wasn't a good am opening gambit, I admit. But uh, anyway, well, here we still are. it clearly did the trick. It clearly, it's clearly still here. He, and, and look, I, I mean, it didn't turn him off. And I think it's two or three years ago now that you got married. We got married on the exact um, uh, 50th anniversary of our meeting. We met on the 11th of February 1969 and we got married on the 11th of February 2019. Okay. So it was exactly 50 years. It wasn't far from the spot. We hadn't been married all those years, of course, but uh, when it ultimately became available, uh, he said an interesting thing because he's, he grew up under the occupation in, in the Netherlands and, and the post-war discussion of the occupation really uh, was a very difficult time in the yeah. Netherlands because there were, contrary to general impression, quite a lot of collaborators. And so that was a very big uh, issue and uh, he, he grew up there and he said, I learned one thing never cooperate with your oppressors. Never make it easy. Because in the Netherlands, the, with their usual efficiency, they had uh, very detailed information on every house where there was a Jewish person. Uh, they'd had their census, they made the map of Amsterdam and other places, and they put down uh, where Jewish people were. And he said, you should never cooperate with people who are oppressing you. So he said, we should not take part in the plebiscite because this is not done for making law in Australia. It's only been done for us. We've been singled out and it shouldn't be done. Parliament should make a decision if they decide against uh, marriage equality, we, we know we can accept it and it'll come back later and it will be passed. So uh, at first we were not inclined to take part, but ultimately we both agreed we didn't want to give a free kick to anybody who was being so nasty to us. And so we did uh, take part and of course it was uh, adopted by, I think it was about a 63% majority, which was a wonderful thing about Australia. It shows how we have changed. Uh, and there's still more change to be made. And, and it's not only about LGBT people, it's, all, it's about all minorities and people who are a bit different. Um, and uh, our duty as in, informed citizens is to try to make life sweeter, and kinder and lovelier for all people. But it led, it was a dilemma deal. for you when that when when it was possible for you to marry. Yes. It was a dilemma, wasn't it? You weren't sure. Well, um, we both first of all we don't call each other husband because that's a sort of uh, 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 a language from the past which may conjure up idea of um, a patriarchy and a superiority and one is uh, the, the husband and one is the wife and that's just not our relationship. So we were, we were a little bit dubious about all that. But we've settled into married life in, our, in this late stage. And um, uh, he, he puts up with me, which is a great blessing. Anybody who would deprive another human being of a loving partner who tells you when you're going wrong and who is kind and supportive and is there when you wake up and is there when you go to bed. It's, it's, it's a great blessing. It's very good for your health. Yes, indeed so. And it, it, it is amusing when I look back, because you, you said you just wanted a quiet little affair of your man, and then it was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. It certainly didn't end up a quiet little affair, the marriage. Well, it, it wasn't on the front page of the Herald until the marriage, and then they picked that up. And uh, uh, it certainly was a great blessing. And I want here, here and now publicly to pay a tribute to my partner, Johan. He's been a wonderful partner. He's been a friend, a supporter. On the High Court of Australia, all the justices loved Johan. <laughs> they were a little bit ambivalent about me. <laughs> 
All right, well, that, that gives us a little bit of a, a, a glimpse into the character. I just thought we must start personally and then we'll get to this sort of lovely interplay between law and medicine and civil society because they all interact very interestingly in your life. Fascinating, actually. Now, as David said, uh, our approach, early response to HIV AIDS was really considered world leading. Um, thinking back to those dark days, what did we get right? Like, what was the unique challenges? Um, and I'm a, I'm a great believer in, in actually looking for competence as well as incompetence, you know, that the media is obsessed with incompetence, but often there's tremendous stories in the competence too, real first paragraph stories. I mean, what do you think we got right? Well, we got right, uh, first of all, in our federal minister for um, health, Neil Blewett, who I think might be here tonight. He's a, he's a really great Australian. And also um, the opposition spokesman, eventual opposition spokesman on HIV, Peter Bohm. Okay. Now, they're both here, and the Prime Minister of the day had Bill Botell, who's here in the front uh, area, and uh, these three gentlemen and others really took hard decisions, and they were decisions which the growing knowledge of the um, World Health Organization um, grappled with. Actually, I owe it to David for getting me involved in HIV. Uh, we had a, um, a dinner party at um, a Harborside restaurant, and David invited me along as um, a judge who was the chairman of the Law Reform Commission and who was interested in medico-legal issues. And there at the table was a very great international civil servant, Jonathan Mann. Jonathan Mann was the head of the global program on AIDS of the World Health Organization. And he uh, later invited me back to Geneva to the Global Commission on AIDS. And the Global Commission on AIDS had some very great scientists on it, Montigny and Gallo, and it laid down the AIDS paradox. Right. And it was a simple paradox, but it was if we want to deal with this matter where well, we don't have a cure and we don't have a vaccine, paradoxically, the best way to do so is to reach out to those who are most at risk. Uh, because then we can inform them about the, uh, the, the virus, we can inform them the way to protect each other and by protecting each other to protect the society, and, uh, and we can engage them and involve them until we get something that will help to cure them or at least palliate the condition. And so that was the message that I got through Jonathan Mann, through David Cooper, and it, it was the message that uh, was then sold in Australia. We were the second country in the world to adopt the AIDS paradox as a foundation of our yeah. strategy. And that's thanks to uh, Neil Blewett, Peter Bohm, Bill Botell and others. Um, and um, that, that is what led to the strategy of reaching out to gay people who were in the front line, telling them about it, removing the last lingering laws that criminalise them, reaching out to sex workers and telling them what they had to do to, pre to prevent the spread of the virus to them and to their clients, reaching out to people who were injecting drugs. Now, that was a no-no at that time, but uh, thanks to uh, ministers of health in the, in the state, uh, and in the federal sphere, uh, including Gillian Skinner, who I see here yes. from the former government, um, it, it, it took courage on the part of politicians, but they were people of courage. They were politicians who were really uh, admirable and they took marvelous steps. Uh, the the uh, injecting drug users, we were second to New Zealand, mm. and right through the pandemic from that time on, we had a much lower rate of zero conversion because of the fact that we had embraced the AIDS paradox and we were reaching out to the people who were most at risk. Yes, as somebody pointed out to me, you know, in days gone by, quarantine would have 
been, I mean, TB, that occurred in, in early days of TB. People were whisked away and, and everybody just sort of accepted it, whisked away from their families. Now, so that was one of the areas, like, did you, if you can think back, did you see, when you ab adopted this paradox, which is, I hadn't heard it put like that, did you see areas, avenues where you could go and shift the law so that you'd contribute to this? Well, the change in the laws in Australia on gay uh, people against them in, in criminal law had already started uh, by the time HIV came along. Uh, but only just, though, had they? Uh, only just, yes. They started in, in South Australia. They're very strange people to South Australians. They're, they're, all of, they're this big German population, and uh, they're, they think sometimes differently, but they took the step under a coalition government, interestingly, followed up later by Don Dunstan in a Labor government. And this was the good thing about how we uh, uh, approach this. Uh, with so many divisions in our society, on HIV, we tended to have uh, a, a coalescence of, of the leadership. And that was a very good thing, and, uh, and it saved lives. And, it continued to be important in the global response because when African countries like uh, Uganda in the last few weeks do nasty things, mm. it, it can be pointed out, you are doing a harm to your people. You are taking them out of the reach of the messages that are necessary. We still don't have a cure for HIV. No. We still don't have a vaccine against HIV, which makes the development in, in COVID, to which the Kirby Institute has contributed notably, um, it, all the more amazing. I'm going to come back to that, but as it was pointed out to me, the thing about quarantine, which was that it did the reverse of what the paradox, it, it took people away, which you know might have instantly taken the problem away, but it also took them away from all manner of health developments, you know, that sort of the sheer need for the health si science of health to be there right with people to try to actually work with the problems, uh, you know, that came forward. But uh, it was pointed out at the first meeting of the Global Commission on AIDS that we didn't have enough barbed wire. Yeah, Already right. the number of people who were infected uh, were uh, beyond the capacity to contain it and therefore we had to adopt a different strategy and without a vaccine and without a cure and with no prospect of, of that quickly, um, we had to step up the endeavour to find uh, drugs that would control it and prevent the spread of it and by preventing that, reduce the risks of uh, spreading it and uh, therefore saving lives. But that, that was, we, we just couldn't have adopted the old quarantine approach. Some but countries tried to. Some countries tried yes, to. Yes, Cuba did, strangely Cuba enough. did? Yes, Cuba, uh, with its sort of communitarian government, it thought, oh, well, we can deal with this, we just lock them all up. But right. uh, there are already too many, and ultimately Cuba changed its strategy. But how did you help chart a, di a, a difference between evidence and stigma? you know, in dealing, with, in dealing with this unfolding crisis? Well, essentially, you just had to convince people, politicians first, public health personnel, the medical profession and others who hadn't thought in this paradoxical way that here was a new problem that required a new approach. Here was a time when the law could be a help in dealing with a pandemic. In the past, the law was, was a help by locking people away and, and mm. uh, uh, calling out unclean and uh, isolating people in biblical societies. But now there was a need to think paradoxically. And Jonathan Mann, he was a most charismatic individual and he had the capacity to convince uh, the rather conservative bureaucracy of uh, the World Health Organization and other UN bodies, and that really made a difference. But it was David Cooper who introduced me to Jonathan, and, the, mm. and uh, I, I don't wish to overstate my own role, but I was actually um, a person who was at the Global Commission on AIDS 
with Luc Montignier, who was the, the scientist who found uh, the virus and described it, Robert Gallo, who uh, developed the test so that you could find out who was infected, uh, June Osborn, who was a great public servant uh, and professor of public health, um, all of these people, they were really remarkable and they had quite a few uh, gay people there. Jonathan, I think, had a sort of radar that he could work out mm. who was gay. And because gay people were in the front line in most countries, including Australia, uh, he thought, well, we should hear from them. And that was a very important feature of our approach in Australia. Was it frightening at the time? Oh, terrible, terrible. Uh, and Johan and I had many friends uh, who we would see and they would say, I've been diagnosed, and, but I'm going to get over this thing. I'm going to fight it, I'm going to get over. Well, they didn't. Uh, and we went to so many funerals. And, uh, and when you went to them, the, on one side of the chapel was the blood family, and on the other side of the chapel was the gay family, and never the twain met. I mean, they, they didn't have anything to do with each other, and, and, and uh, Jan was a, an Ankali, uh, mm -hmm. that was a group who were buddies, as they would say in America. Of they accompanied people, people didn't yes, they? Yes, and, and they... They, mainly the problem was finding somebody who wasn't repelled by your infection and who would talk to you. Mm. So uh, and that was not uh, a matter of risk. This was a case of learning in a public health crisis the importance of scientific truth, of empirical data, and of getting that out from the medical profession uh, and the scientists to the general community. Look, you, you also cite the powerful impact on you of your work with the International Commission of Jurists, to, to which you brought a very definite public health agenda. Why did that matter so much to you? I, I saw you say it recently on a YouTube that I could see it had been quite important. Well, don't forget that I had been trained as a lawyer and I, at the time, was a judge in different courts and not at that stage, uh, the beginning of the uh, AIDS epidemic on the High Court, but uh, I, I, and I had been chairman of the Law Reform Commission, the Australian Law Reform Commission. So um, it was important for me to take part in the International Commission of Jurors because it was the most notable international body uh, and we had a meeting, you know, I think it was about uh, 89, and uh, they said, what should be the future? Let us look into the future as to what the future human rights issues are going to be. And so I said, well, one of them is going to be the human rights of people living with HIV. Uh, and another is going to be the human rights of sexual minorities. Uh, and that caused a tremendous uproar in the very distinguished and rather elderly group of lawyers uh, on the International Commission at that time. And there was one of them, a, a very nice man. Uh, most people who, who can sometimes be nasty in these circumstances are quite nice if you get them on their own. But he said, um, well, I I'll accept uh, human rights of people living with AIDS but please, please, we're not going to deal with homosexual because I, I come from Ghana and there are no homosexuals in Ghana. And uh, I said, well, look, I've got a little bit of information for you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that was, uh, these are sincere people. Yeah. The, they, they're very affected by missionaries. Uh, Christian and Islamic uh, missionaries who tell them that it's an abomination. I mean, here we have in, in Russia, for all its faults, the Soviet Union had become a strong secular state and really kept religion out of politics. But Mr. Putin, along with one or two other little defects, has re-embraced Mm. Uh, the church uh, has got the um, uh, Archbishop of uh, Moscow, uh, the Patriarch, uh, to come on board and they have reintroduced all these criminal laws which had been abolished in Russia. 
They have indeed. Uh, your work in India, I think, is part of that. It was something that you considered one of the most important things you did in your life. Uh, I do. Um, well, there was a very good uh, South African judge who not only was gay, but he was HIV positive. That's right. And he's, well, this is Edwin Cameron. Uh, I mention it because he's very open about it and was from the beginning in South Africa very open about both aspects. Uh, and he uh, responded positively to an invitation by a civil society in India. And it's important to make, pay respects to civil society organisation, organisations of gay people and of non-gay people concerned with this pandemic. And he said um, uh, we should help uh, the Indians and respond positively to the request that we become involved. And so he and I went to India uh, in what we called the caravan and we were taken around to different cities in India uh, to speak to the judges uh, uh, about HIV and its consequences for the law. And um, that was uh, rather interesting to do that because there was very little talk about homosexuality and very nothing about HIV. But we, we introduced it, and when, when Edwin mentioned, when I mentioned that I was gay, well, that was a bit surprising to them because they were not used to talking about private matters that you shouldn't ever discuss. Uh, but Edwin then uh, revealed his HIV status. Right. Uh, he's still one of the only people on the African continent who is open about his HIV status. But they looked at him, and he's a very intelligent, he's a very tall, impressive, uh, and patently honest person. And I remember a, an incident where the Chief Justice of India, Chief Justice Verma, at a conference like this, talking to the judges, just got up and embraced him wow. in front of the others. You know, this was such a wonderful thing, but he was so greatly affected, not so much by me, but by Edwin, who was open about these things and said, had I not been a wealthy white man in South Africa uh, with a judicial salary, I would not have been able to get the drugs that got me over the barrier to make me alive to come and speak to you about this and about the legal issues and why the judges should be involved and why the paradox matters. And of course, that was relevant in India because they had the British-imposed uh, criminal law in the yes, Indian Penal back. Code. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he was talking about this and all these judges who were well, conservative but intelligent people listening to a person, giving it uh, directly from his experience, and they just went away and we lost contact with most of them. But Subsequently, a case came before uh, one of them who had been at a couple of these seminars that were the caravan, and his name was Justice Ajit Prakash Shah, and he became the Chief Justice of the Madras High Court uh, in Chennai and the Chief Justice of Delhi High Court. And in the decision in the uh, Delhi High Court, he led that court to embracing the paradox and to saying the provision in the British Criminal Code, uh, which was itself a miracle that they got this code for the whole of India, but the provision in criminalising gay people is not only bad in principle, but it's very dangerous in the circumstances of our pandemic. And so he struck it down and he he, uh, he then, that was challenged in the Supreme Court of India and ultimately the Supreme Court of India in a great case called Jovar against the Union of India um, unanimously uh, said these provisions which do not treat people as equals, which are singling out this minority are contrary to the basic principles of our Bill of Rights and therefore they cannot be part of India and this provision is unconstitutional Goodness. and it is struck down. So that was a really great decision. Huge. The Indian Penal Code. On the day that happened, 
uh, there were celebrations throughout India amongst gay and straight people. Um, and it meant that if you take a certain percentage of people are gay in every population, it meant hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people in the most populous country of the world were suddenly liberated from this uh, criminal law and they removed an impediment to getting the message out to the people of India, gay and straight, um, injecting drug users, sex workers and others. And that was, a, uh, I think, a very important outcome of the civil society effort to get the, to get the paradox over to the population. See, it, it, the Commonwealth trouble, the Commonwealth does seem to have, you say, a, a problem with gender identity issues, um, much more than the places that have come from other empires, which I found very interesting. Can you flesh that out for us, please? Yes, well, uh, the, the French, uh, during the French Revolution, the States General in 1793 uh, had before them the Royal Criminal Code and, uh, of France, of Royal France, and they said, uh, this is the one that penalised uh, gays, just the same as the British and the Russians and all the others. And they said, this is rubbish. We're not going to have this. And so the States General abolished it in France. And the French Penal Code, which Napoleon, soon after the French Revolution, adopted uh, in France, um, was then copied in the French African colonies, in the French uh, colonies in uh, Asia and, and the islands and so on. And so that was a big point of distinction. And the German and Netherlands criminal code was copied on the French so that this was a very special feature of British rule. Wherever the Union Jack had flown, they introduced the criminalization of uh, sodomy, as it was called. And that was something that is still lingering on. Half of the 56 members of the Commonwealth of Nations still have those criminal laws. And trying to get them to change them because it's an overreach of the criminal law is not working. And even trying to get them to change them by reference to the AIDS paradox and reaching out to the risk mm. populations at risk is not um, happening. Well, I think you say that um, HIV AIDS is twice as prevalent in Commonwealth countries as elsewhere. Yes, when we were trying, we had, a, I was on a, a body called, and I rather like this title, the Eminent Persons Group, <laughs> uh, to advise on the, on the development of a charter for the Commonwealth of Nations to replace allegiance, which had been the glue that bound together the British Empire, uh, to have a charter and the the problem was that uh, it had a lot of resistance in uh, countries uh, like uh, the countries in Africa uh, and a, a clue to this is what's happened in recent weeks it's got a lot of publicity of Uganda reintroducing the death penalty for um, some gay offences so the, the battle isn't over and uh, you can never be still and quiet and um, uh, re reticent when such uh, resistance exists and when you, you have a duty to share the truth and the knowledge. Look, the I truth will make us free. I don't know whether you are a podcaster yet. I'll bet you're not. Do you, do you listen to podcasts? No, I take part in them. People, <laughs> people come and they talk well, to me. I chatter away and it, it's all out there in podcast land. No, I was, I, I'm, I'm a complete uh, devotee of one called The Rest is History. And uh, it's with two terribly bright, you know, British polymaths, sort of uh, Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook. And they did a two-parter recently on the trials of Oscar Wilde. And it was absolutely brilliant. And their thesis was that that had been such an amazing event in the life of the British, the British and possibly by extension the Commonwealth, I'm just thinking of what you're saying, that there was so much that flowed from that. You know, so many sort of, uh, like it, it played into existing prejudices, but it was so vivid. Oscar was such an extraordinary character, the interplay of the establishment and Oscar and the law, that it had incredible, it had a legacy for many, many years. Now, I just wonder whether it did, 
you know, it, it sort of subtly did influence Commonwealth attitudes. You must give me the address of this photo. I will, I will. It's really, <coughs> you, you'll adore it. It's, it's I, I haven't heard that uh, suggested. Um, uh, the British were the first country in the English-speaking world to adopt the reform of, of the um, uh, criminal laws against gays. And they, uh, they had a, a Wolfenden Commission by Sir John Wolfenden, and it turns out later that Sir John Sir John's son was gay, uh, oh. but um, that might have been something that uh, contributed to his view, but right. they proposed in, I think it was about uh, 1956, the abolition of um, the law in England, and that was achieved in, I think, 1967, uh, and so they changed it, but I think that grew more out of the Kinsey report because the Kinsey report had a lot of foundation in good science. Kinsey was the world's greatest expert on gall wasps, and then he turned his attention. You know, scientists are very strange people. <laughs> they have this passion about samples, and, uh, and he had billions, or well, certainly millions, of uh, samples of gall wasps. And then he suddenly thought... Oh, he started oh, human sex was more oh, interesting. I'm sick of this. <laughs> <laughs> he woke up one morning and he said, I'm going to do something completely different. And his wife probably said, well, what is that, dear? <laughs> and he said, it's going to be human sexuality. And uh, that's what he did. And um, that, that made people realise that the attempt to make you pretend, because that was the, that was the, the art... Mm. Pretend that you're straight. Well, that, yeah, the love not, that dare not speak its name. That was the great, yeah. the great piece from Oscar in 1896. It was yeah. The, yeah, well, it was done in order to not confront people, especially religious people, with the awful reality that there is, boringly enough, in every society, just this small number of people who are not uh, straight, who are not heterosexual and... Uh, and this, I think, led to the English reform, and then in the manner of those days, copied in Canada, then in New Zealand, and then in South Australia, it crept through Australia. In two states, um, uh, Queensland and Western Australia, where they have a criminal code, which is a bit different, uh, they, they changed the law, but they had a preamble. Joe insisted on a preamble. Uh, in the Queensland Code, which said, we don't really approve of this change that we're, it's being proposed, but we've been told we have to do it in order to prevent the spread of HIV, and therefore uh, we're not going to penalise uh, gays from now on. Strange uh, times, but uh, we made progress because of leadership. It was the leadership of um, politicians, top bureaucrats, it was really a magical time in Australia, and New Zealand got there a little bit earlier, and their example, particularly, say, needle exchange. Get the, uh, get the um, needles, uh, the clean syringes, out to people who are uh, drug-using, uh, drug-injecting, and you reduce the spread of the infection, mm -hmm. particularly in the straight community, mm. because the, the needle exchanges are reflecting the general population. So that was a very important step, and it meant that uh, a few years down the track, we had very low infection rates in the people who were injecting drug users. It had been opposed. Police commissioners opposed it. They said it's against the war on drugs. We mustn't do this. It'll be the end of civilization. But it was done, and yeah, it, I remember, it, I remember it saved lives. It was very interesting debate. Well, look, let's just move to the present, and um, because, you know, COVID global research collaborations were were spoken of as being unprecedented in in their scale and speed and scope, but. Um, I think you believe that a lot of the groundwork for this was actually laid in the AIDS epidemic. Well, I think the uh, HIV pandemic uh, taught a very important thing, uh, and that is that um, the politicians and, and the public servants have to communicate. They have to communicate 
with civil society, groups representing minorities, have to communicate uh, on television with the general uh, community. And I reckon that even though um, there were various problems in our journey with COVID, uh, every night when we went home on the telly was the minister and his top public servant. And they were wonderful and they just answered questions from the media. Uh, and uh, I think that's something um, that was learned from the AIDS epidemic. You can't keep these things to yourself. Mm. And in the audience is Michael Kidd, who was one of those bureaucrats, uh, officials with great expertise in medicine and medical communication. And he got, and he would answer the question, help the minister. And that was making transparency and accountability. And I think that helped us during a time when we had to do various things that at other times would not be tolerable. tolerable. Well, there, uh, well, well, in fact, it's interesting because the Victorians um, have just done, I think, a, an assessment of whether there were certain groups uh, that did not benefit from all of this discussion. I mean, and, and they have actually looked at whether there were certain groups in parts of Melbourne that were um, associated with the Muslim community that actually were were not included and were sort of, the talk actually became counterproductive to them. And I mean, there is an argument, I know that some people make it that some of the people who were non-Anglo-Saxon in, in this community in Sydney, which handled it differently, also, I think they had more, um, they were prosecuted more often for breaches, for instance. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the cultures and communities are really on show their, their essential character is on show at times like this, isn't it? Yes, uh, but I, I, I can't but think that uh, the religious communities and the, um, the minority racial communities were, as it were, swept along by the change. I was told only yesterday by a vice chancellor that uh, a, a university in Australia uh, is applying to join the vice chancellor's committee, uh, and this is Avondale, which is a Jeho which oh. is a Seventh Day Adventist. Yep. And Seventh Day Adventists, as I know from other various account uh, in involvements, including during the um, Lindy Chamberlain, Chamberlain matter, are, are very nice people. You know, they're they're not very different to Sydney Anglicans. They're very Protestant. Oh, very surely they. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, uh, we won't so, go there. No, but they, 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 they were under question because of the COVID and their response to COVID. Yeah. They said, yeah. these are blood cells that are derived from human beings. And at first they didn't agree with it, but they changed their mind uh, during the public debate. And uh, it may be that the, the churches and the religious hierarchy have taken one step, but I would think you would find that the, the other, the general population are watching the telly and it's not mediated by um, religious or other prejudice uh, and they come along with, with uh, the rest of the community. I think that is what is happening in Australia. Now, there is a question around rights and freedoms, which is tricky in all of this. Um, Anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, uh, is, is it ever okay in your judgment to enforce rules, even if they do cut across people's inherent choices? Well, the way we normally solve this is um, by uh, providing uh, exceptions on conditions which can ultimately be appealed to a judge. And uh, the judge weighs up the public interest of uh, enforcing um, vaccination and uh, respecting the individual rights. Uh, normally by favouring the general public in times of a pandemic. Um, and I, I, I do think you have to respect people with minority views. Uh, our society is not one where we just go around forcing things on people. But Even during pandemics? But during pandemics, there, there is a special need to protect the whole community. And so it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of getting the... 
uh, proportionality of the response. I wonder if there's a paradox there, you see. Yes, well, there are many par Life is full of paradoxes. <laughs> it's why I don't read novels, because when I was on the High Court of Australia, every week I had a new set of novels, the, the problems in the court. There was the amazing things that human beings do to each other. <laughs> and uh, if you read the reality of appeal books, You'd never want to read a novel again because they're <laughs> tame by comparison to what ordinary well, look, folks do. Before we do go to questions, there is something. One of, some of my lawyer friends who knew I was talking to you said, look, will you put something to him that they found troubling? That when you began in the law and when I started in journalism, law, lawyers had a standing. It was sort of a real sense. There was, you know, doctors and their ethics and lawyers. Um, and their contention, my friend said, that's gone. Lawyers are now seen as much more for hire, you know, for advice that they might be giving to all manner of business enterprises, and they don't quite have that prestige that they once did. Now, do you agree with that? Well, I, I agree that things have changed, certainly, since I, I was at law school. Things have changed remarkably, but... On the other hand, back in those days, women were very minor in the law. Mm. When I was a young article clerk, I was working in a small legal firm and uh, a secretary who was um, very, very um, able and talented came in one day in slacks and she was sacked on the spot. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and likewise with, with other minorities in the law. And people never talked about the stress and pressure of the law. And when I started to do this, after a conference I attended in Canada, um, people said, oh, get over it. You've got to pull up your socks and just get on with the, your job. Your job is inherently stressful. They said to you? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, and I was attacked. This was uh, soon after I was appointed at the High Court. They had to sit there and listen, but uh, I was attacked. And, uh, but now, you don't go to a legal conference without people laying it all on the table. So maybe we've lost a bit of the pres uh, prestige and mystique. the glory mm -hmm. and mystique, but maybe we've, we've come to terms with the reality that law is a position that uh, should be helping society uh, that should never be rude to people or unequal in the treatment of people in court. I had terrible judges bullying me when I was young. And you never give your best when, you, when you're being bullied. If you were bullying me now, I, I wouldn't be chatting away like mm. this. Mm. But um, so I think, we, yes, we've lost a bit of the prestige and the medicos too. But um, maybe less that's... so the medicos. That's that's the interesting thing. But that's a very interesting response. So I shall take it back to them. Um... Yes. Oh yes. You tell them. <laughs> oh, if, tell if them. <laughs> oh, hand it back. If they've got a problem, them. get them to send me an email. <laughs> yeah. now and the... Yet another email. This is the final question. I mean, when the Kirby Institute was launched under your name in 2011, David Cooper said this. He said the institute particularly researches infections that quotes occur in social groups that might be considered marginalised, disadvantaged or voiceless. This is where our interests and those of Mr Kirby intersect. Um, now, what would you say about the importance of organisations like this, uh, you know, 10 years on from that, in terms of this effort to have m fairer global health solutions, which I know sort of, com you know, completely preoccupies you? Well, the Kirby Institute is foremost in, uh, in pursuing a, a global uh, approach. We reach out to the uh, region in particular, but wider than the region. Uh, a lot of the brilliant uh, professors, many of them scantier professors of this university, uh, are leaders in the world in things such as um, uh, hepatitis, uh, and issues of uh, COVID have been uh, really at the forefront of the Kirby Institute. Professor Rainer McIntyre, who is here tonight, was, uh, was frequently on the television communicating things. Greg Dore, who's a world expert in uh, hepatitis. 
uh, and therefore in the injustice in many countries of making uh, the necessary drugs that can um, uh, remove uh, and help people with hepatitis. Um, uh, Professor Grulich, who works on anal cancer and which is strongly supported by uh, the Glendenbrook Foundation. You know, there are, uh, that's not a sexy, or well, it's not, I'll rephrase that. Yes, that's not, a, that's <laughs> not a, an attractive sort of thing to give money to. No. The Glendenbrook Foundation does and the Kirby Institute does it. And, um, and I think this is, this is a wonderful leadership role. Uh, global health. Uh, and the uh, director of the Kirby Institute, uh, Professor uh, Anthony Kel uh, Keller, who's here, uh, is uh, part of the global outreach uh, of the Kirby. And I'm very proud of this because it is, in fact, a sort of continuation of things I learned through David Cooper from Jonathan Mann. You know the story that uh, one, of the, one of the poets said, we, or was it a scientist, we, we only make progress by standing on the shoulders of the giants. And, and uh, I think this is true for uh, science and medical science and health science today. We learn from each experience and it has become more inclusive in the legal profession Okay, hang the prestige. If you, if you don't have the prestige and you can't bully people and you can't tell them just you accept it and please go away and don't trouble us, um, then uh, I don't think that's the right way in a mm, mm. time when people are better educated and more questioning. And I think that's a very good thing. And transparency in government is a very good thing. Well, look, thank you very much indeed, Michael. We've got some fabulous questions, actually, that have come in. So I think we've got 15 minutes or so for that. Uh, I'm, and I'm just going to look precisely at that. Um, do you feel, this is one question, that politicians in today's era have less courage when making hard decisions on difficult topics? Well, some politicians do, some politicians don't. I think it's... it's uh, it's a very uh, individualistic thing. I mean, there are people in this audience who were politicians who were uh, sublimely uh, courageous. And there are uh, other politicians whom we could all mention who are not so courageous. But in, in, in terms of the fundamentals, I think in tackling COVID and in tackling HIV, we were much more courageous than we were in earlier pandemics, in the flu outbreak in uh, 1919 mm. uh, and in earlier pandemics, we were not so courageous because we were in the prestige generations. Mm. And if there's, if there's a trade-off... Like polio, for instance, is interesting to think about, you know. Yes. I mean, that was panic, of course. Yes. And it was tragic and because it was about children's limbs. But. And President Roosevelt, uh, who, in a sense, we would see today, uh, who was undoubtedly a very great man, mm. had the capacity from his polio, which he had during all the time of his presidency, to... Um, to uh, speak about and communicate and uh, explain. I had a case in the High Court where uh, there was an objection to the fact that Aboriginal people in a hall had turned their back on Mr Howard as Prime Minister. And I said, uh, in Australia, that is a protest. And in Australia, we allow protest and we make, sometimes we agree with them and sometimes we disagree with them. But that's, um, that's something, it's part of our democracy, a free expression. Well, let me, another question. With the inevitability of future pandemics, is there room for a legal national pandemic framework that preemptively delineates specific powers and needs? Well, that was something which was sold to President Obama. And he, in fact, uh, set up and instituted and established such a, a national body. And it was all there at the time Mr. Trump came into office. But one of Mr. Trump's first uh, of his many actions was to abolish it. 
and uh, therefore they didn't have that in place when COVID came along. Right. And that's when Mr Trump said, oh, well, you just got to take a dose of um, hexachlorophene or something and you'll be right. <laughs> yes, I do, I do remember. Now, this is a tricky one um, uh, about trans rights. In light of your recollection of the Australian government's swift HIV AIDS action, what should the government be doing to protect and promote trans rights? Well, um, this is something which requires a lot of thought and experts and, and listening to trans people. I mean, uh, you can't now impose things without communicating to those who are most at risk. And as somebody who grew up um, being told, just shut up and, and, and pretend. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy uh, for trans people, or sympathy is not the right word, understanding and respect. But um, there is an issue in respect of trans, and it's an issue of at what age is, is a person um, able to make the very important decision about um, uh, hormonal injections and the even more important decision of uh, surgical intervention. And uh, in the past, the answer that society gave in the recent past was, well, that, we can pass that over to the judges and they can decide that ultimately. But um, nowadays, I think there's a, a recognition of the growing role of the individual, the family and the, the, the child themselves uh, to make the decision themselves, but I'm not underestimating the difficulty in some cases. Uh, I, I went to a conference in Hong Kong where they invited a, a, a doctor from Belgium who was an expert in trans, and his job was to conduct operations to try to repair and sometimes reverse operations where trans people changed their mind or the operation was completely botched by the local doctor who didn't know how to do it. It's one of the most heroic uh, surgery procedures that, that you can have. And so that taught me really that this is a complex question, but the bottom line that should guide us is uh, respect for uh, people who find that they feel locked in a body that is not in keeping with how they feel and how they find the world and how they want to make their way in the world. But there are steps on that journey that require uh, some extra um, help and extra principles. And I think we're probably still developing those principles. And But excluding trans people and passing laws that forbid the, the mention of trans and forbid their participation uh, in sports and forbid their participation in schools um, is not the way to go. Another question. Would you like to comment on the health and human rights in respect of your wonderful investigation for the UN into human rights in North Korea? Well, uh, human rights of, of um, citizens up there got got down to real basics, one of which was the human right to food. I mean, in North Korea, they spend an awful lot of money on their nuclear arsenal, but they don't feed the population. And uh, this is the sort of issue, and it's similar with, with uh, health care. To some extent, uh, because of their nuclear development, uh, North Korea has been cut off from the funding and the sources that will provide them with essential health care. And in our report, we insisted that a humanitarian aid uh, had to be isolated and they had to receive humanitarian aid. But often the problem was that North Korea would not give access to the necessary information of uh, humanitarian organisations, often American, that tried to help the local population. So it's a very complicated uh, issue, but North Korea is not a very friendly place. And of course, they never allowed the Commission of Inquiry of the United Nations to go in. Uh, but the report is still there, and it is there as an indictment 
of uh, North Korea, and many people got in touch with us after it and said, well, we haven't had anybody convicted, we haven't had uh, any substantive change within North Korea, but at least you invited us, and you invited us, if we were willing to do so, to give testimony in public, and you put that on the internet, and we had the opportunity to speak truth to power, and that is still there, and it is still troubling uh, humankind, and eventually we will have uh, the freedoms and uh, liberties that other people do. I think that's a perfect epilogue <laughs> for a wonderful life. Uh, Justice Michael Kirby, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Michael and Geraldine, for a thought-provoking and enlightening uh, conversation. We will all take different lessons away from that to think about this evening. But for me, what I learned is communication of knowledge is power. And in health, that knowledge is most powerfully communicated if it, in if it involves and, and is determined by the at-risk communities. That's because that approach allows the knowledge to be translated into the correct vernacular. It's a lesson that we need to learn and relearn and reinforce. Marginalisation, stigma, criminalisation all stifle that communication of real knowledge. We must rail against those approaches. This event is held in honour of the Kirby Institute's founding director, David Cooper. David led the Kirby through the first, its first pandemic and beyond with an ethos that he encapsulated always in just three words, just do it. He spoke these words long before it became a marketing catchphrase. The institute David built was one that has breadth and depth in scientific expertise and is sustained by an ethos of ambition with agility. Driven by this ethos, the Kirby strives to respond rapidly and effectively to the challenges of the day, informed always by the advice, guidance and support of the communities with whom we work. I want to thank you all for making an effort to come out on this midwinter night, and in particular, I want to thank any donors who are in, who are in the room tonight. Your donations have given us the agility to respond rapidly to, the, to many challenges, such as COVID-19, MPOX, HIV, or the consequences of human papillomavirus infection. Further, the donations to the David Cooper Memorial Fund have allowed us to ensure that David's legacy is passed on to the next generation and nurtures the next generation. Our first David Cooper scholar, Dr. Gail Cross, uh, is a clinician researcher who has led clinical trials into the better treatment of tuberculosis. She has just had her first paper published on this work in the highly prestigious journal Lancet, Lancet Infectious Diseases. And I'm pleased tonight to make the announcement that we have awarded a second David Cooper scholarship to David Honeyman. He will conduct his PhD research on, the, on early warning systems that predict and prevent future pandemics. For anyone considering supporting that agility, or the next generation of researchers, or any other aspect of our work, I remind you that donations to the Kirby are tax deductible, and if you're very quick, you could even get that tax deduction this year. <laughs> Thank you again, Michael and Geraldine, for your enlightening conversation and to David Gonski for making such a great opening speech. For those of you who are interested in finding out more about how Michael's mind works, his thoughts and his ideas, his books are available for sale in the foyer and Michael will be out there to sign them. Finally, I want to thank the university for its support in general and in particular for helping us organize this event, particularly through the Center for Ideas 
and from the Faculty of Medicine and Health. I also want to acknowledge the team at the Kirby uh, for all the work that has gone into putting this event together tonight. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the constant support and inspiration of Dory, Alana and Beck Cooper. After two years of online lectures, uh, it's very, very special to have everybody here face to face. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Go well and be safe.